Hey, brother. Hear me now. Brother, dog. Know me. Understand. Welcome to the Sargasm Podcast. I'm Robbie Thigpen. I'm Francesca Elmer. And I am Mar Fernandez. And we are your hosts for today. And we are going to share with you the latest ideas and concepts about sargassum and sargassum beaching events, which have become an international challenge. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the Sargassum Podcast. Um, Mar and Robbie, how are you doing today? And do you have a story of something incredible you did in your life? Because today we're going to talk about two people that did something that not many people ever did. Well, I'm doing fine, but no, nothing as exciting in my life. I wish I would have time to do something super exciting, but I'm stuck at home writing proposals to get funding for research. So yeah, that's about it in my life. Not much going on. Yeah, and I'm kind of like the more I'm, I'm the knave of mediocrity and all every every day is just a lot like the day before. And I'll, however, I sent a, a thing out to Sargnet yesterday and uh, about looking for a couple of people to help me uh, write a chapter for our bioculture curriculum on sargassum and sargassum beaching events. I got a nice response from Edwin and uh, in uh, the Virgin Islands and from Camille in Guadalupe this morning. And so I'm looking forward to meeting with them and seeing what we can do to create some material about sargassum. But another thing that happened to all of us this week is we have a sponsor from the uh, Florida International University and Kimberly Green Latin American and Caribbean Center Study and the LACC U.S. Department of Education Title VI grant. They're uh, sponsoring um, 20 uh, podcasts for us and uh, going to uh, help us get a, a few interns this summer to help with it. So we're very excited about that. Yeah, the, it's very exciting indeed. <laughs> Um, yes, my life has been quite normal as well. Every day is kind of the same, working during the day and then um, going to the beach to check the sargassum in the afternoon. Is it still there? <laughs> we had a lot last week on the weekend, I think, for a few days. And now we have a lot of waves and it's all gone. So there's not much right now, but we had a... We had a bit of a of a, a heap like this big for a few days. Wow. Yeah, well, awesome. Well, <clears throat> normally Fran does the bios, but today I'm going to do it because I think these are some of my uh, long lost relatives and all that uh, that we're going to talk about today. And you know, um, I was telling everybody just a few minutes ago some of the stuff I've done in the past. I don't really talk a lot, a lot about that, but I want you guys to know that I've got a uh, over, you know, almost a thousand base jumps, usually very, very low, less than 600 feet or, or 30 meters. Is that right? Or uh, 60 meters and all. And um, also I've, I've climbed on four continents, stood on the roof of a continent. And uh, a lot of the, the routes I've done were started at elevation above, uh, above uh, 3,300 meters. And um, oftentimes we climb without ropes and it's just an amazing thing. And we got to, you know, and it takes a certain kind of person to enjoy those kind of things and to revel in that place. And we got a couple of people like that today. Um, we've got Mark, who's, who rode as a, a part of a team across the Atlantic Ocean. And we got Jazz Harrison, who solo rode across the Atlantic, if I understood correctly. She's a, the uh, youngest female to ever do that, which I think is really awesome. And, and they've done a whole lot of other things, too. And we're going to be talking to them today. I think uh, Yasmin is a part of uh, Team Rudderly Man and all of which I think is very appropriate. And and Mark's, uh, he rode the Atlantic, uh, across the Atlantic four-person team called uh, Force Genesis Team. And and they, you know, they're my kind of people. They're, uh, they would, I think they fit very well in the the groups of people of my cohorts in the past. And uh, I'm just I'm just excited to be here with them today. So welcome, Mark and Yasmin. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you for inviting us to be here. Yes, um, thank you for being here. And just to add to what Robbie said, so rowing across the Atlantic, it's actually rowing 
3,000 miles, which takes about almost three months to do. So it's, it's really one of, one of the toughest things people are doing on this planet. And the first thing I want to ask you guys, which is very kind of related, but unrelated, maybe also unrelated to actually this rowing challenge is what is sargassum to you? Um, sargassum to me is, uh, depends on the time, something to look at. <laughs> <laughs> definitely something to see in the middle of the ocean when there's nothing else there it's oh seaweed wow um but then it's also uh seaweed get off my oars wow yeah much much this much the same really i mean i d didn't know anything about it until um we probably first spied it really um and then of course we we're in contact with the race organizers all the time and sat phone to home and you know and it's like wow it all became very clear as to just exactly what this was and where it came from and the implications of it and as Jazz said it was um it was nice to see the one the one motivational thing was about it we just sort of joked about it at the times so like all we got to do is follow that wind row and we will be in Antigua so it was like follow and we laughed about it but it was follow the yellow brick road with what we sort of kept saying and that's exactly what we did in many ways um but then as jazz said it's um it gets it gets entwined in your oars and your dagger board and your rudder and the damn stuff quite frankly was everywhere at times it's like you know just get rid of it but um sometimes difficult to avoid that's a beautiful yeah. metaphor that you did there of following the the yellow path like dorothy um, did you actually know about Sargassum before you went into this uh, crossing the Atlantic or it was the first time you saw it when you were when you were there? No, I didn't know until we literally hit it. And then, um, like I said, on one of our sat phone calls to uh, to the organizers and stuff, it was like, you know, we're, we're in the midst of, you know, a, yeah, seaweed, like, you know, seaweed everywhere. And um that's when it was just sort of like, you know, that's sargassum seaweed and this is what it is. And you'll probably encounter, or you may encounter quite a bit of it was, um, and for sure we, yeah, we encountered lots of it and lots of it from a long way out. Yeah, that was the same for me. I had no idea about it, literally not a clue. And even then I was seeing lots of little bits really early on. Um, and then it sort of picked up and it changed each day. And it was, what is this? And I remember speaking to one of my friends back home. She's saying, seaweed in the middle of the Atlantic, where's that coming from? What's that? And it was only like, I think posts on the um, like Dot Watchers page and stuff that follow all the race was people talking about it. Um, and that's where I found out. And I was like, cool. Well, it's got a name, um, but there was nothing else that really bothered me at that point. It's actually, find out afterwards and I was like it's not going to harm me there's nothing there but tell me the cool things I don't want to know all the negative things about it what's good um and it was actually it means that maybe you're getting closer to land I'm thinking oh okay right this is very good I'm like please I want to see more I really want to see more of it and then uh and then at that point I was like you know what I don't care it's just something to look at still for a lot of us working with Sargassum we actually always look for opportunities to go into the middle of the ocean to go study it because that part of sargassum is very understudied and it's kind of amazing that neither of you have known about it and you're rowing and then you you're out there in the ocean and you're trying to figure out what it is that you found um which is quite the opposite of what we would be doing if we are we are on stuck on land and we would love to go out there and see it um but I want to talk to you a bit about um, your your challenge. So both of you raised money for charities while rowing across the ocean. Um, can, you, can you tell us a bit what charities you chose and why and how much money you were able to write, raise and if people can still donate? Um, so I was doing it for two charities. That was because I saw hurricane damage in the Caribbean that they helped out with in 2017. Um, 
And then my second charity, the Blue Marine Foundation, which was just appropriate because I wanted both a human and animal charity. And they are protecting the oceans and rebuilding them to health after overfishing. Um, and I think I'm just short of raising £20,000 on my GoFundMe page under Woodley Mad. Um, so it's 10000 for each. So I'm really happy. That's not what I expected, particularly given COVID and everybody's a bit struggling and unsure of what's going on. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, so and, and our charity was um, one sort of local to us, although they do cover the whole of the UK. Um, they're called Devon Freewheelers. They're a blood bike group. So it's a, it's a bunch of volunteers that move blood for, between the hospitals for transfusions and organs for transplant. Um, and, it, and even... Um, can't think of the, the word I want to use, but sort of tools for operations and things. So they move all of that around on motorbikes. Um, and there are lots of groups. We we wanted to raise money for the one local to, to where we live, which we did. Um, and I got involved with that really because we were struggling a little bit to begin with to pick a charity because it's not the easiest thing to do. It's just, you know, because there are so many options, obviously. Um and the guy that started it locally almost lost his wife on the operating table, who's become a very good friend of mine. So there was a there was a there was a there was a good sort of feel good factor sort of conversation that went on, and we just thought, yeah, it's knits together quite well. And and I think we're about fifteen grand or so at the moment. Um, um, again, via the GoFundMe, which I'm not sure quite what we expected really, but. Um, I, I think their view, a bit like mine, is it's 15 grand more than they had before we put our boat in the water. So, you know, that, that can only be good, really. Yeah, that's truly amazing. And it's excellent that you managed to raise so much uh, money for, for the people by doing something that you love. Um, Jasmine, I wanted to ask you, so how did you come up with the idea of, of doing this? And then while you were doing it, what were the, the toughest, but also the most beautiful and exciting moments that you had during the crossing the Atlantic? Okay, that's a very long answer for me to answer. I'll try and make it short. Um, <laughs> I was in the Caribbean in 2017. Um, I went to do some swimming teaching in Grenada and then got on a sailboat and island hopped, sort of like just hitchhiked through 15 of the islands. Um, went down to Trinidad and straight up north. I was in Antigua, we were in Antigua waiting for some new sails um, for about three weeks. And there I learned about the end of the race. Uh, first of all, the guy that owned the boat I was sailing on, he was on a different one at this point. And he first of all said, people have rowed the ocean on the tiny, I would never imagine doing that. And me knowing there was a historic dockyard, thinking this is something that was hundred years ago and that was how to discover Antigua, that people rode there. Um, and it turns out it wasn't. So. I got speaking to um, family members um, of another person that finished and started telling me, oh, he's just become the youngest guy to ever do that. I really want to do that. And then I spoke to the support yacht crew just at the bar because I saw him with the Talisker brand. And I was like, oh, guys, be part of this. And then I went to go watch the finish line and I was up holding a flare on the floor. I was like, this is cool. I'm definitely going to do this. So that's how I found out about it. it. Took me a year to decide to do it, like convincing myself and also growing up a little bit then. And um knowing how to sort of put together a campaign. And um, I can't remember the rest of the questions. I forgot now. <laughs> well, <laughs> that, that, that was wow. Say. So that, yeah, was, that was awesome. Incredible. I mean, <laughs> but yeah, the rest of the question was, what were the, the, the toughest and the best and most exciting moments oh, yeah. during the crossing the Atlantic? Um, so a lot of the toughest moments came right at the start because I had a really bad start and having a reaction to seasickness patches and it meant I couldn't I couldn't actually see like I couldn't see my navigation so I literally didn't sleep for days because one I couldn't see my navigation to tell me that the land I was hallucinating was that was there wasn't actually there um, and so I spent a lot of time literally going in a circle not knowing anything um, and then it was because I'd sort of had a, quite a slow start and got hit with really bad weather and so I was just thrown backwards even with power anchor out I lost like 30 miles in two and a half days just literally going backwards and you know it took me another day to then get that back and it was just so difficult especially my auto helm broke and so 
you row in and the wind's just taking and I'm trying to go this direction and it's determined to take me this direction. The swell's coming over, you're tired, I'd not eaten and it was just miserable, like awful. I'm just there effing and blinding at the sea, like, do you not want to help me? What have I ever done to you? You know, sort of just get me there, get me out of this. And then it was just the unpredictable. I didn't realise that that first bad lot of weather was going to hit. If I knew that right at the start, I'd have rode a lot faster and harder and quicker. But um, that was really tough. But at the same time, in amongst that, it was the most amazing, memorable experience. Because in between the, like, sheer, between being on power anchor and the 25, 30 knot gusts blowing you the opposite direction, it was then flat calm, like, mirror the entire ocean you couldn't tell where the ocean finished and the sky started because it was just so like mill pond and the sun sunsets absolutely stunning like you can see it and it changes the entire sky so you've got purples blues reds oranges it's just absolutely mesmerizing and the reflection in the water as well and that's when you've got dolphins coming up and it's just honestly you've got birds flying out it's on I actually think I was dreaming then I was kind of mm -hmm. oh, hallucinating this again this is so amazing and honestly the amount of then I just didn't even row because I just couldn't I was like this is just insane and then on a night and it full moon the sun finally completely goes down and then the moon comes up but I was using it that as my steering so that's what I would look at because I didn't I just all steered pretty much the entire way so it was balancing out on one side to the other and you're using the moon and the reflection right in front of me to keep on track as it's rising up but it's so bright bouncing straight off the water it's honestly like I needed to wear sunglasses at night because it was just straight into my face I'm like wow okay and everything else is pitch black and you've got that shining right at you it's just that's a massive high for me and seeing all the different wildlife having the whales just pop up when I was literally swimming in the sea I was cleaning the bottom of the boat and I just got back on I was sat there for 30 seconds, like, these two big whales come next to me. I'm like, wow, like, this is just incredible. So there was there was a lot of lows, you know, things broke for me all the time. Um, I had cap sizes. I had lots of boats that tried to run me down as well. I ended up being quite close to quite a few. Because um, my AIS system broke um, that tells me there's another boat there. So trying to sleep at night, you know, I'm constantly checking, paranoid that this massive tanker is going to hit me again, you know. Um, it's just incredible but definitely all the high is just seeing and you can think back on one night just seeing the night sky just the stars that like gets is so much I don't know what the right word is but to have that I would go through every sort of bad experience wow that's um, impressive and I mean you were alone all the time right like you had no support around you no, the there's two support yachts, but the first one came past exactly a week um, as I'd set off and just took pictures and I was actually disappointed to see them because I was like, I'm not lonely yet. I want to see you in a few couple of weeks' time. Go away. <laughs> um, and so that was quite funny. I said, you know, you really annoyed me when I saw you. He was like, what? Jasmine? Why? <laughs> um, and then um, the second support yacht as well, like 56 days or something. So... You don't really have to see people on the bridge. Seeing people, it was, it's cool. No support, though. Completely unsupported. They can't help you in any way, unless you're, like, going to die. And how, how did you organise the, the sleeping time and the rowing time? Like, how many hours per day were you rowing constantly? And then how did, how did you decide when to go to sleep and for how long? How did you organise that? Um, so I rowed the majority of it in bulk so I'd row like t I'd row at least 12 hours a day sometimes it would be between 12 15 but then if the weather was horrendous at the start to get out of bad weather um I'd be rowing for like 18 hours it was just rowing till I'm tired I'd just keep on rowing keep on rowing try and break it up by jumping in the water or doing a job on the water maker that's a, that's my break you know and then I would just sleep um sleep really easily but I did wake up every two hours just to check that there was my steering was okay that I'm going in the right direction for that time um yeah I, I just did what I liked that's a, what I quite like about being solo is there's nobody else nobody's relying on me for anything like I would really struggle to do it as a team everybody said wow solo I'm like no I couldn't do it as a team I need my own sort of 
if I want to sleep, I'm going to sleep. You know, I don't want anybody to say, it puts you all shift. And in fact, they've just been rowing. And I'm like, meh, because I'm lazy. Uh, the amount of times I'd be laid in bed on a morning going, nah, I ain't going to get up until I really, really need a wee. And then I've got another reason to get up other than rowing. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I just, I just did what I like. There was no real routine to it. It was just what I felt like at that point in time. And even then it wasn't, I mean, it kind of wasn't up to me. Like, people, like as I'm rowing, I'd say on a night, right, I'm going to row till two o'clock or something. And I just didn't. And then suddenly, randomly, I don't know how it happened. I just be rowing and then I don't know. Oh, that was my last oar stroke then. Okay. And it just get up and that's actually yeah, done. It was, I didn't really decide. It just happened. To, I did an oar stroke and I was like, oh, right, that stopped. Let, let, let's go to bed. So, yeah, it, it wasn't up to me. Just see what happens, see what your body tells you. Really, from from the logistic point of view, I, um, there's a lot to be said for rowing solo. Not that I'm ever going to do solo. Um, Jasmine's far braver than I am, but um, um, certainly the, the 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 difficulty in any crew is obviously you have to have a regime and a, and a structure that is you know that fits all. Um, and we did two hours on, two hours off, period. So two guys were in one cabin, two girls were in the other cabin. So we did boy girl for two hours and then swap with the other boy girl and literally two hours on, two hours off, day and night um, for the duration, which um, as Jazz said, you know, the, the tough bit of that is sometimes you didn't sleep very well on your two hours off and then that was quite easy, but sometimes you were just so sound. And then of course you've got your partner knocking on the door saying, "Night, your two hours is up, mate. You're back on the oars." Um, and it would have just been nice every now and again to have just had that extra. Do you know what? I'm going to have four hours sleep. It would have been, you know. But anyway, um, structurally, that's what we put together. And um, you know, at the end of the day, it it, it worked for us pretty well really there's no other way of doing it when there's other bodies involved but um yeah sometimes it would have nice to have had a, had a good sleep in um like like jazz weird but well, i think it just does for everybody everything everything that could have gone wrong did go wrong um from from power issues battery issues auto helm issues water maker issues it's just it's just what happens out there it's a it's a hostile place and um and things break, and, um, and, I, and I think we all went through the sort of mental side of it is, uh, is, is I think for me, after about a week, I, the first week was like, oh, this is great, this is all, and then after about a week, it was like, oh, really, have I, have I really got to do, you know, another four or five weeks of this, and it's like, oh, really, and it's, there's almost like a wall that you go through, just like, oh, yeah, um, not a, not a physical one, but for me, I think, and for, for all of us, the, the mental one of, of just coming to terms with, I've just done a week, I've got another four or five, six weeks to go. Um, and it takes just a little bit of bursting through that to get used to the idea that you ain't going anywhere. It is what it is. And you just need to do more of the same and more of the same and more of the same. And I think, I think after a week for all of us, I don't know what we thought was going to happen really that the fairies were going to magic us to Antigua or something um and it's at that point you take a big intake of breath and go like yeah the, the only way I'm going to get there is to man up buttercup and um yeah keep pulling these oars a million and a half times or whatever they tell you is the is the sum total and 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 you and you get through it um in, in terms of the wildlife, I'm absolutely with Jazz 100%. The sunrises and particularly the sunsets were just amazing. It'll never, ever, I'm never, ever going to see anything like that again. It was it, phenomenal. Um, the night sky, um, I mean, I'm blessed. I live in a really rural location and we haven't got any artificial light here. And we have fantastic night skies here, but nothing like we saw um, in the middle of the Atlantic. Um and bless her, um, Gemma had one of these apps on her mobile. So, and I said, well, what's that there? So she did the old overlay of her mobile app against the night sky. And it would say, oh, that star is such and such. So um, sometimes I'd be rowing and Gemma's just, you know, uh, mobile up at the sky. And we're just trying to work out what they're all called and, you know, how they all join together and all this sort of stuff. So that was, yeah, a phenomenal time. Um 
that was. And yeah, wildlife, the only thing that was, would have been lovely, we didn't see any whales, which was a, which was like, everybody's gone, I wonder if we'll see a whale today, but, but we didn't. Um, but my birthday was the 29th of December and around, it was probably late on, it was either late on on the day of my birthday or it just gone past midnight, so it was my birthday, and I can't remember which. Um, it was it was flat as a mill pond, absolutely flat as a pancake it was, and the, and the moon was out, um, and it was my birthday, and we were probably surrounded by about 200 dolphins. It was just like, whoa, they were just all the way around the boat, in the moonlight, in a sea that was absolutely flat as a pancake. Um, strangely, that all happened on the day of my birthday. So, yeah, that's a pretty nice memory to uh, have just, you know, tucked away for good. Wow, that sounds amazing. Um, so you already told us a, a bit about the wildlife um, did it change over over when you went over the Atlantic? Like, is is the middle of the Atlantic? Is there as much life as on the sides, or or are there patches where you see nothing? I I don't think it particularly changed really, other than bird life. Bird life got more significant. Um, and obviously we knew how close we were, but bird life picked up big time when we sort of thought, you know, we're only a week away from Antigua. Um, bird life seemed to be, yeah, much, much, much greater than anything that we'd experienced probably, um, you know, going across. But anything we saw going across was storm petrels probably. Um, but then certainly when we were the, uh, from a week, even probably a bit more on that, a week or so from land, lots more bird life and lots more um, species as well. I don't know what you saw, Jazz. Yeah, so my I had birds the entire way across. That was like I don't I, I, I don't even know what storm petrel looks like, but there was quite small birds I had. Um, so I don't think it's that. They were literally I'd see one every pretty much every day or every other day, um, and that was, it was quite interesting. But for me, yeah, the uh, the wildlife didn't change massively. The biggest thing that I noticed was flying fish. So I didn't have like any flying fish until I was at least halfway. And then it started off with all the tiny ones. I would literally only have miniature ones that would just that land on me. And then a little bit further on, I'd then get, they, they were literally getting bigger the further on I was going. And then um, I'd get more of them. And I'd only ever see one as well flying. And then the closer I get to land, the more schools you see. And the more they were actually landing on my boat. So that was the biggest difference that I noticed with the wildlife. Other than that, it was pretty the same the whole way across for me. Um, but then I even like really strange, it's like I had a crab on my boat, um, literally in the middle of the Atlantic. Um, and I'm like, how? <laughs> that, 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 that's not the thing that I expect to see. Like I put um, a rope over to clean the hull just to see what would happen with that and as I brought it back up I literally had a tiny little like albino crab hanging on to this rope that I that had been under the bottom of it I'm like that's so strange like I don't think it really matter or makes any difference I'd, I'd fish the entire way across I'd derided all the time I'd um yeah I had everything and right from the start I had pilot fish under my boat then they were there the entire crossing so it wasn't much difference. Maybe some of them just came with you all the way. They just the birds and the crab. They just followed you. I think so. Well, that's what the the pilot fish anyway. So they would they're always there. Um, and like mythologically from the Greek myths and stuff, they are meant to or they follow a vessel right from the start and lead them all the way to the finish. And so I was like, okay, you're my helmsman because I don't have an autopilot. You're you're the new autopilot. Off we go. Um, which is quite nice. And, but the thing is, they, they did change though. So, it's, like, they were all tiny, tiny, and had loads of them that were tiny right at the start. And then they'd get bigger, like this size. And then one day, as I was pulling up my pack, I had a massive one. It was absolutely huge. And I was just like, wow, okay, what's this about? Um, so, yeah, they, they just changed. I don't think it was the same ones either, because this massive one that I saw one day, never saw again. So, it was like, where have you come from? Where'd you go to? Have you just, yeah. 
It's, it's really strange. They're always there, but they weren't the same guys every time. What about plastic and trash? Did you see a lot of that too or not as much? Not very much, actually. I, I think I thought we were going to see more um, uh, trash in the ocean going across. I mean, we saw some, um, but honestly, not very, not very much, um, which I suppose can only be sort of viewed as good, really. But um, th there were there were a few things, but yeah, not very much, not very much at all. No, same for me. Um, there was bits, and here's it, this sounds completely like reversible, and I don't mean this in a bad way. But I actually really enjoyed seeing plastic because it was something to look at. I was like, oh my gosh, there's something in the water. What is it? What is it? Can I guess what it is? Is it's coming closer? And I was like, oh, it's a mop bucket. Why? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I get like, it was really, really sad, actually, that I, I was enjoyed to see the plastic. So there's one day I was on a power anchor and a boy was coming past and it took, and I honestly, it, it took me two, it was two hours. And I was like, what time do I think this boy is going to get past me? I was just sat there like watching. I'm like, hmm. We're taking like just bets with myself. But um, to be honest, more relatable, the most plastic I saw was when there was seaweed around in the sargassum. Um, it was, uh, so I even had a glass jar that was floating with its lid still on in, in the sargassum as it comes past. And I came across the big, um, big patch, like islands of the sargassum. And that's when there was a lot of plastic. Still not a lot relatively, but you could just see it. And so I had a boy, I had like a, you know, the sort of jerry cans and things like that floating around. But the biggest um, sort of litter I saw was actually um, fishing net and just rope. There was a lot of that around and sometimes being a massive heaps of it. And you could see it because it was like a brighter blue or green colour. It was just all clumped together. And it's actually, I was trying to, that debate in your head I'm thinking I need to avoid it because I don't want it to get caught like around my rudder but I'm like the chances that there's like animals or things caught in it and it's just interesting to see as well um so I want to get closer to it it's just like how do you do that but when you're rowing as well to see something it's difficult because you for me I'm looking that way because otherwise you get really bad neck ache and so suddenly something across oh no I just missed it or you know, it was, it was quite annoying um, having that because sometimes I'd be like, I want it right next to my boat. I'm like, there was a water bottle or something. I'm like, that's probably come from another team. If I can get that out of the water then. I lost a water bottle. Was what, was it bright yellow with a red lid? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah not nice. That's, I'm, I'm, I, I, um, and I think this next question we got, I, th I think we've kind of, you kind of covered that, all, both of you in, in, in answering the other questions and all. But um, Jazz, you said you've been fishing. I don't know the, the whole way I believe. And, and, and Mark, maybe you were, you were fishing too. What kind of, um, what were you catching when you were fishing on your journey across the ocean? Um, so I started to fish right at the start. However, um, my fish line broke, which I've never been so annoyed at in my life for multiple reasons of that was my fish line and it means I can't catch anything and I really want to. Um, but also I was thinking I've just lifted in the ocean now. Great. Um, and so I didn't, I was a Dorado that snapped that line um, and I didn't have spares with me either. But the fish that I saw, uh, it was, I had... Dorado all the time, big, huge variety of sizes. Um, so also Mahi Mahi, you might know it better as. Um, and then I had some, it was pretty much Dorado. And then there was, I had something called Triggerfish, which oh. I didn't know what they were called. I was just describing, I described them as, if it was a person, it would have arms out of his chest and back. Um, and it, that was quite interesting. I was like, what is, and I thought, what's going on there? Like, I've never seen a fish swim. Like, are you, why are you so wonky? I was like, what's wrong with you? And I was thinking, have I discovered a new mutant fish in the Atlantic? Um, and then it was only yesterday that I was looking back through some of my footage and I have um, film of tuna. And I don't remember seeing tuna. I, I don't actually remember it. But obviously I'd have seen fish, thought they were Dorado or the trigger fish again, put my camera in the water, 
and I've not looked back at the footage until yesterday and I went, oh, that's some really good footage of a massive tuna. I like it. Um, so if I was catching things, you, it would be Dorado, potentially the triggerfish, um, tuna. I, I saw a striped marlin as well, which was quite cool. Um, I don't think I'd have ended up catching that though. Um, there was a flying fish. <sighs> yeah. I, I don't know what I would have caught, but the biggest heartbreak was my fish line snapped. Like gutted, like gutted, gutted. How about you, Mark? We, no, we didn't. We didn't do any fishing. We had, we did take a fishing line, but no, we didn't. Um, I mean, we saw the fish that that Jazz um, mentioned. We didn't do any fishing. That the about our only scary moment, and Jazz will say the same thing. A couple of boats got um, harpoon speared by um, the old blue marlin this year. So where the beaks actually penetrated the boat. So um, there were a couple of guys had to do some repair jobs when they were out there and you you knew there were some serious blue marlin around particularly probably is just almost approaching sunset because the the tuna were jumping um and they were jumping to avoid the blue marlin um and on one we saw blue marlin come out of the water bite the tuna clean in half bit went one way bit went the other way and the blue marlin back in the water so yeah we knew they were around um and one particular day, one of the girls went, oh, there's a shark coming to the boat, shark coming to the boat. Well, it wasn't. It was a blue marlin that must have been, what was our boat, 29 feet, 15, 15 feet plus lengthwise. and came bombing up to the boat, didn't do anything, but it, but it circled round. It was weird. It must have stayed with us for about an hour. And we were all concerned that it was going to disappear and come back and maybe damage our boat. But it came sort of disappearing. You could see it, and then it would circle the boat, circle the boat, disappear back, circle the boat, and probably stayed with us for about an hour. Which everyone was like, you know, a little bit. Is is it after us? Is it going to try and you know damage our boat? But 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 no, it didn't. But they were around with plenty of them. Wow! And you're 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 more concerned about marlins than you were sharks. I've never heard anybody yes. on the planet ever say that, just so you'll know. And I'll first yeah. time here. <laughs> and I'll um yeah, there I were, go ahead. Yeah, no, there were there were two boats that ended up with beats through the hull this year. Um and apparently that's because they go for the tuna that are sort of underneath the boat, you know, shading from the sun. And I suppose in attempting to get the tuna, they get it a little bit wrong and end up piercing the boat. So um so that was our concern of just, you know. Are we going to end up? I mean, you take patching stuff um, for that very reason, or for one of those reasons. So, um, yeah, there were a couple of guys. Um, I was chatting, chatting to Anne. What's, what was the name of Anne's boat, Jazz? Because um, he had to do a patching job, and he ended up doing a patching job. Um, oh yeah, Wave Warrior. Wave Warrior. Yeah, yeah he, he was using a kitchen chop. He used a kitchen chopping board, didn't he, or something, to fix the hole in the boat that the Blue Marlin had made. So. Um, yeah, that was our only concern of ending up with a hole. Really, um, yeah, but I, I did that. I went and got the um, all my epoxy and put it in my cabin just so I knew exactly where it was. And to me, I was like, right, okay, if I get prepared for it, the chances of it happening are a little bit less, you know, because of the sod law. Yeah. But if I think about, oh, I should maybe do that, and then you don't, it's going to happen. So I was like, right, prepare for everything. Went got all the epoxy straight in my cabin, and I was thinking about, it, and you're terrified because I'm like. This is how you're trying to sleep in the night. I'm thinking that it could come straight through. It could literally go straight through my stomach. So I'm like, right, okay. Have I got a satellite phone? An excess. If I got pinned to the boat right here, can I access things to help? I'm like, what medical do I stuff have with me? Then I'm like, I've got to have everything in my cabin. Yeah. And so it ended up my cabin was a complete state by the end. And then I had capsized and everything was everywhere i was like oh god maybe i shouldn't have put so much stuff in here um but yeah it's it's big fear it's the marlins but um i literally only saw the striped one once and it just came around me um a few times but I, I wanted to see more i really did i wanted to see everything um so i'm quite jealous of that that's, that's really cool yeah but also the chances of you seeing it you know if you're asleep at a certain time or like, it's a bit easier for you guys because at least you've got people on deck all the time. So the yes. chance of missing something, you know, and that's what I was sort of, I was like, I want to sleep. But I'm like, yeah, but 
what if something happens? I don't want to miss it. Um, <laughs> so little things like that. Yeah. yeah nice. Um, you know, um, I'm wondering if uh, you had to row through any of these thick mats or did you just avoid them? And if you did row through them, was it, was it akin to uh, rowing through butter? We sort of skirted around the mats because you could, you, I mean, we, we worked out obviously, you know, well, the wind rows were what we saw. The, so we, so oh, I was chatting to Amy the other day about this one of, when, when it, um, and she thinks we saw the first wind rows about 1500 miles out. So about halfway, we first saw those and those were literally uh, just, you know, 30, 30 centimetres wide, probably a gap of, but they were multiple. So probably three or four or five metres wide. And then there was another one and another one and another one, but they were just strands. Um, and so we, we followed the strands, which were no sort of problem. And one uh, Gemma kept saying maybe go through one of the wind rows and into like another gap between you know between a couple of strands um and it was only and it was only later on that the mats were yeah absolutely ginormous i mean some of them were you know the the, the, the size of several football pitches and yeah we just avoided those like the plague um because we'd already picked up as jazz said that um i think the anti uh, there was an antiguan pair rowing um and that they got caught up in some of it fairly big time. So it was, you know, we, we did all we could to, to, to try and miss it. Um, and, and we missed all the big patches um, pretty well. Um, so that didn't really create too much trouble for us. How, how deep do you think these uh, patches of sargassum were? Good question. I, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, I had a funny feeling that you were going to ask that. I mean, my my feeling is not very deep probably i don't know four inches at a guess you know as you say sort of that what i would say four or six inches and um, i don't think it was any any deeper than that um certainly the wind rows weren't because it was just literally strands so that was like two or three inches that was just literally you know just little strands all the way along it was only the big patches that you had a sense where were thick but again as you say I would say sort of like that, I think. What do you think, Jazz? Um, so I, the strands again, are exactly the same as Paul you. And then I would, I couldn't really avoid the big patches, like you say, fields and fields. Um, because it was so wide, the by the time I'd turned around to see another one coming, to then go completely off course and head like due north, to then go around and avoid it, it was just so difficult. And I managed to just skirt onto the edge but it stops you, it stops you dead in your tracks. You can't row through it either. And just for me, it was so much effort and the effort I was putting into it, I was like, you know what, I don't care. You know, I'll just sit here, this is quite interesting. You know, I'll just stand here, just watching it. I'll just take some pictures. Um, and then seeing also the rubbish in it, being, oh, what rubbish is that? Is that a lid? Is that McDonald's? You know, um, but when I got to the edge of it to, to get free, um, when the wind finally pushed me through, um, I thought it was like a foot, it was like a foot deep. It was really deep. I don't know whether that's just at the edge or what, but I know when I'm trying to row, even though you, I was trying to scoop it um, as much as possible, but my entire oar, which is what, like that thick anyway, that was still all within it um, when I was trying to row. So it was, it was quite deep, but I also know it was clearest water ever when I got to the edge. And my biggest regret of the entire row was not putting my camera in the water whilst I was in the middle of the sargassum like absolutely gutted because when I got to the edge I saw some fish like dart and I was like that's such clear water I never thought there's going to be stuff underneath it I was underneath. like what? there could have been everything and honestly that is one thing the biggest regret that I keep on kicking myself about because I had time you know what I mean I could just put the GoPro stick straight in but I wasn't I was just filming what I could see and it's oh it's really really annoyed me we but, would um, love that. <laughs> so that, yeah. you have to go back and take videos of sarcasm for us. <laughs> well, Genuinely, you, you, I'm so annoyed. Well, you guys can do it on y'all's sailing slash research trip. Um, so yes, yes. So you and Fran can do that. Um, but you, you know, uh, the next question I'd like to do is kind of goes back to my history a little bit because you know some of the things all the three of us do is it takes a certain 
mental state to be able to do these things. And, um, and I'm wondering if you could talk about that for just a minute. The mental state to do the row. Um, or just, or just it, not just to do the row, but to say, I'm going to do that. Because you go, you walking down the street, you're not going to find a whole lot of people like, yeah, that's a good idea. I'm going to do that. Um, matter of fact, it's, you, you go against that very thought. So it, just yeah. to, to accept that to begin with is a pretty big deal. And then it. Yeah, I don't really know how to answer it because. Awesome. That's just, it's just me. That is me as a person. <laughs> And because I'm not, because because I am me, I can't answer for how I would feel if I was somebody else. So yeah, I don't know. I'm just born like that, I guess. You're yeah, just like I, all of us. You're just like all of us. Bonkers, really, is about the size of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah what, what the thing is, kind of like me, people are like, why you want to jump out of a perfectly good airplane? And my response has always been, why wouldn't you want to? Um, so yeah, it, it, I have a. Personally, I, I don't know about Fran and Mar, but I have a bigger, a uh, bit more difficult time understanding why people would want to do some of the things that we've done because it's really cool stuff. And also, uh, yeah, so, man, it's, it's, it's great talking to you folks. It, 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 as Jazz said, it's, it, well, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a hugely difficult one. It's, you know, um, chatting to all my mates, you know, before all of this in the pub, and it's just like, uh, you know, so so you're really going to do this? Yeah, I'm really going to do this. Like, why are you going? And it's just as you said, like, well, why why wouldn't you? There's um there's an Atlantic Ocean. It's three thousand miles. Um, people do it. Not very many people do it. Four hundred and fifty people so far. Um, it's going to be a great challenge, a great adventure. I don't know what I'm going to see, but I'm going to see loads of stuff that apparently now you're never going to see. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't know why, but yeah. Um, and, and even people now have been back are just sort of like, well, you did it then. Yeah, you're damn right. I did it. <laughs> it's like, um, so difficult to answer. So difficult. How good did it feel when you finally arrived? Oh, mega. Yeah. Um, that's probably even harder to put into, uh, it, but yeah, I'd sort of, I even now live and breathe that all the time. And I know it's still fresh for me as, as, as it is for jazz, but, um, yeah, that's, just, that's harder to put into words. It's just all consuming though. You, you don't know whether you want to laugh or cry or probably both, um, and then that's just that's just sort of like the whole, you know, it just you're completely consumed with every emotion. I think that your body's capable of producing and of just that, um, yeah, almost silence, probably in a way of just like, yeah, I, yeah, just everything comes out really. Of um, that was the first bit when you let our flares off, and then, and then even worse when you get to the quayside to see family and that would have, you know flown across to see it in it's just like uh whoa crazy that is totally crazy if you could bottle that emotion you could sell it for a fortune yeah one of the things that i'll out of that uh conversation i had with somebody one time really comes out right this minute you know why you want to go all the way over there to climb that mountain and which my response was <laughs> i've never i've never climbed that one before you know and and they said, well, why do you keep going up there to climb that one? I said, well, I haven't climbed that one enough. And I, I think it's the same kind of thing. Uh, I, 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 once again, it's, it's hard to put into words. But like Jasmine said, it's uh, it's just who we are. Yes, that, that probably that probably sums it up, really. Um, I mean, we had all sorts of crew changes in, in, the, in the very beginning. So in the very beginning, for, in the very beginning, I was going with three other guys we were going as a four um four guys um and within six months three of them said no I was, well not I was not that I was kidding but you know what I don't think this is for me so I, as you say it's just who we are I think because not everybody are like this <laughs> whatever this is that is <laughs> yeah yeah exactly, <laughs> what, exactly whatever this is just bonkers really I guess that's the thing that I find really interesting is the fact that I've absorbed and surrounded myself with ocean rowers for the past year and a half. It's normal. Like, 
I only sort of know people that are doing this or want to. And so it's really strange to, and because I've not been back into my community yet, literally arrived back home the other day, um, I'm like, I've, I've not met people that wouldn't ever want to do this, you know, because I've only been with the positive people that are supporting me that are this. There's never been sort of a, um, oh, I couldn't, oh, no, I wouldn't, oh, you're stupid. You know what I mean? I've not had that for a long time. So actually, I'm really interested to see people that would be like, couldn't ever, no, definitely not. <laughs> because everybody that I've met, it sounds really strange, but everybody that I talk to, they're cool. Like, I, I, I mean, everybody, just even just the sailors being in Antigua and just everything, it's, I'm meeting so many amazing people through this. It's like, no, this is cool. Like, I don't care whether you say you wouldn't be able to do this, but you've done something else that I wouldn't be able to do or I aspire to do, and I don't know how you've done it. So it's, it's really strange. And I just think this is another thing that so many people have the potential that um, it's just relatively new, you know, it is quite... It's interesting. Yeah. The thing is, it's easier for us to communicate with our cohorts within one of these things that we're doing than it is to really communicate some of this stuff with uh, people outside of that group. And all. Um, you know, I'm, I'm discussing climbing with climbers. We uh, we use a very specific vernacular. We know what each other are talking about. Sometimes we can predict what the, ne the next person's saying and stuff. And I'm sure it's like that with the rowing community. We, we have our own language that we use and uh, even though we're still using speaking English we talk we use the words differently than than we would if we were talking to somebody on the street and it's it's our language and it, it exp at least explains to each other very clearly what we're doing and getting outside of that talking to other people I think is where it gets difficult yeah you, you you summed it up a bit for me then with something you said just then, Robbie. It's just as you said, why would you want to? That's you know, that, that's where I come from. This why would you want to? Um, but there's not there's not many people that that resonates with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> Excellent. I think we could continue asking you questions for hours and hours because this is such an exciting uh, adventure that we would want to know everything about it. I'm definitely looking forward to seeing some of those videos and the footage that you took in the middle of the Atlantic since I will never dare to do that. So I'm happy to see <laughs> the photos and the videos that someone else took. And yeah, thank you guys so much for joining us today. And we hope to see you again doing some of these fantastic adventures. And next time, remember to take videos of sargassum. <laughs> <laughs> under under underwater. Yes, underwater. Under, underwater. I've got plenty on top of the water, um, just not under. So just get those on your next trip. Yeah, well. <laughs> anyway. But thank well, you for um speaking to us and it's been it's been nice. It's been brilliant. Yeah, thank you very much for yeah, really enjoyed being a part of this. So thank you. Sin palabras. <laughs> no tengo no tengo palabras. Oi. <laughs> Yeah, that was amazing. I mean, it's incredible that for them it's like, oh yeah, we just saw this algae there and we didn't know what it was. And, you know, it was interesting, but like, again, we live in our bubble and we think that everyone knows about sarcasm and everyone knows that it's in the middle of the Atlantic. And then we realize, no, that's not the case. That's actually why we're doing the podcast because not everyone knows about sarcasm. I think maybe next year before the challenge starts, we should make a little leaflet for the, the people rowing so they know about sargassum beforehand and we can ask them like, hey, if you have time, if you're stuck in a mat, put your camera down because we are interested and these are the things we want to know from you if you get across this stuff. Yes, definitely. And also for the Vendor Globe sailors and all these uh, ocean race uh, sailors, that would be cool. Yeah, we should do that. Sounds like a plan. Otherwise, um, hearing their stories about, you know, how long you have, like you just pretty much get up and you row and you do nothing else, but then you see all this nice wildlife. It actually reminded me, I mean, it's nothing like what they did, but I pretty much every year in the last three years, I would spend about a week or two um, going on bicycle vacations. 
I biked through Sri Lanka, I biked through Cuba, and I biked from Switzerland to Holland. And there as well for several days, you know, only like 10 days maybe at a row and with the day in between of rest as well, you would be biking for like eight hours a day. And you see all this amazing stuff, like especially in Sri Lanka, I would see all this really amazing wildlife, like right next to me on the being on my bike. And their journey, of course, way more, way longer in the middle of the ocean. So completely different place, no people around. It really reminded me of that. And you're just like in the moment you are on task and you're just dealing with what, what life gives you and with completing this challenge of going from A to B and not spending much time in front of a screen or anything like that. You're just mostly focusing on, on, on doing that and, and using your own force to get from one place to another. It's actually some kind of meditation, right? Yes, it definitely is. And sometimes you hate it. Sometimes you're, well, biking your butt hurts and you're like, ah, I, I want to stop. I'm tired. Uh, yes. But then other times you just, yeah, you love it. Like, it's so great. I really like Jasmine's approach to saying, you know, I did whatever I wanted. Whenever I wanted to row, I was rowing. And whenever I wanted to sleep or swim into the ocean, I would do that. I think that's a really cool way of approaching it. Yeah, I, I, I certainly uh, self more, more identified with uh, her journey than I did with Mark. No disrespect to Mark, but uh, the, what she was saying and the, how she was describing things really resonated with me. And I guess that's it. I guess so, yes. Hey, thanks for tuning in today and learning with us from our guest. If you want more information about what our guests talked about today, then, then check with our uh, show notes and links and information in our archives below. And don't forget to like and share our podcast with your friends. If you enjoyed our podcast, then please consider supporting us financially by becoming a Patreon. For as little as a dollar per month, you can support us and take part in an exclusive monthly Zoom meet and greet for Patreons where you can network with our podcast guests and all the other sargassum enthusiasts. The Sargassum Podcast is produced by Marine Conservation Without Borders and is made possible with financial support from the Kimberly Green Latin American and Caribbean Centers, U.S. Department of Education, Title VI grant. It is produced by Marcel van de Kamp and Francisca Elmer, and your hosts today were Robbie Tickpen, Francisca Elmer, and Mark Fernandez. We will be back next week with another exciting guest. The music of this podcast is from the song Dem A Pray by Brazil Road Rana, an artist from Ruatan. Follow him on Spotify or YouTube for more music. But for now, here is the full song Dem A Pray. Hey, brother, hear me now. Brother, dog, know me. Understand Now for them no one busy we get nothing That's why they must be at no race front and star Now for them no one busy we get nothing That's why they must be Now for them a free They must be They must be no gain progress Now for them a free They must be They must be They success Now for them a free they my pray me no gain progress, not for them I pray. They my pray me to reap success. So me tell them yeah, my missus my man me no take that. Only if it come from Jah, I'll accept that. Not for them I put no trust in I give me setback. Yo, say left that, me lam pull up that. Tell some wicked that bad mind me no fear them. Anytime them cheat and chat, me no hear them. Me dash a few hearts so body queer them. Me dash a few hearts so tell them wear them. Not for them I pray. They my pray me. In progress, not for them I breathe They my pray me to reap success So me tell them yeah Yes, me know me have a lot of fake friends But me never would have taught me would have have fake family So me tell them straight, me no trust them Me no trust you and me no trust him Fake friends lost, lost bad mind lost in a real life star Me no rate that star, me no rate that uh, Me real family would have bust a million shot in a real life real, real, real Not for life. them I breathe. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Enough of them a breathe Them a breathe me to great success Enough of them a breathe Them a breathe me no gain progress Enough of them a breathe Them a breathe me to great success So me tell you yeah. Local life, but they might hate and grudge and creep on mine. They might move like Judas, they might move like Judas. Plus, everybody have a life to live. So, when they give one rash clock, why try judge me like them chit chat? So, what them want to say? Cause none of them out there, not nah, be it. None of them are free. They might free me, no gain progress. None of them are free. They might free me. Success, not for them a free. They a free me no gain progress, not for them a free. They a free me to reap success.